Okay, are we recording? Yep. Um, so welcome everybody. This is uh, John Santa Pietro. Um, we are uh, really excited to be doing this grand rounds today for a couple reasons. Uh, one is uh, having Dr. Hoffler here. The other is we're trying we're trying Zoom for the first time. So uh, after a lot of feedback um, with the idea that it would uh, be a, a, an easier platform to have dialogue on. So um, bear with us. A lot of thanks to Vanessa Cardella, who is uh, really helping us organize this and is steering the Zoom ship, as it were. Um, and and uh, again, just bear with us if we run into some glitches, but I think we have a plan. Um, and as you uh, listen to the Grand Rounds, which will be, uh, as always, for about an hour, and then we'll have 15 minutes for discussion, feel free to use the chat function, uh, which uh, you should have access to. Um, is that right, Vanessa, <laughs> that you have access to? <laughs> okay. Uh, um, and uh, especially, oh, somebody's putting something in the chat. Yes, they do have access, wonderful. Uh, and we can use that for a place to catalog questions or have, have dialogue. Um, and then we will uh, see if we, it would help to unmute some people in the question and answer. Um, I just want to uh, say that we are recording this, so we will be able to share it later. Um, Dr. Hoffler does have up right now the, the Q code for, the, for getting uh, credits for the uh, lecture and he will uh, also have that slide up at the end of the presentation for people. And so uh, without further ado, I am um, going to turn the introduction over to Kamisha Morris, who many of you know, um, is here at the Institute of Living and is the director of uh, social work of social work and also has been an absolute uh, essential part and leader of the diversity, equity, and inclusion work at the uh, Institute of Living and across the BHN. Very, very thankful to have her here uh, today. And uh, Kamisha, I will pass it over to you to introduce Dr. Hoffler. Thanks, Dr. St. Pietro. Um, welcome, everybody. I am glad that I had the honor to introduce Dr. Hoffler today. He is a colleague and a friend and a mentor and um, I'm glad that he, he'll be presenting today. Um, Dr. Stephen Hoffler is an assistant professor in the Department of Social Work at Southern Connecticut State University, where he teaches across their undergraduate and graduate programs. For the past few years, Dr. Hoffler has elevated his advocacy to addressing systemic racism in the criminal justice, child welfare, educational, and healthcare systems, and instituting restorative justice practices in various settings. Dr. Hoffler's 25 years of clinical and professional experience has also included positions as, mental health, as a mental health consultant for Yale Medical School and Connecticut Juvenile Detention Programs, a clinician at the Institute of Living, Child, Adolescent, and Young Adult Programs. His practice experience has also included clinical, supervisory, and administrative positions at Yale New Haven Hospital, Yale University School of Drama, Connecticut Department of Children and Families, and the Annie E. Casey Foundation through Casey Family Services, where he served for 10 years. At Casey, Dr. Hoffler served as a Deputy Division Director for six years in their Hartford Division and provided administrative and clinical oversight of its foster care, post-adoption, reunification, and community involvement programs. At Casey, he also served on the leadership team that managed the New Haven Grants program of nonprofit agencies dedicating to improving the lives of children and families. Additionally, Dr. Hoffler served as the project director for the Center for Children's Advocacy for the Deep and Diversion program where he was responsible for implementing the principles of restorative justice in Connecticut juvenile justice system. He has taught adjunct at several universities and continues to serve as a consultant for several nonprofit and government agencies. Dr. Hoffler received his BA in history and his MSW from the University of Connecticut and his PhD from Smith College School for Social Work. He serves on several advisory boards, 
holds several professional memberships and is a member of the Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. In 2019, Dr. Hoffler was awarded the 2019 Humanitarian Award by Senator Richard Blumenthal in the Connecticut Martin Luther King Jr. Holiday Commission. He maintains a private practice in North Haven and is the father of a toddler son, Tyler. Please everybody welcome Dr. Stephen Hoffler. Thanks, Kamisha and uh, John. Um, um, first of all, I'd just like to say hi to everyone. I feel like I know everyone because I'm sort of at home presenting, um, but also um, very humble to actually be speaking um, on this grand rounds, particularly on the uh, subject that I'll be presenting on racial projections and enactments in the clinical relationship um, from a black clinician. Those 25 years, <laughs> I've, I always uh, reluctantly tell people how um, many years I've been working, but even as Kamisha was uh, reading my bio, bio, it really does speak to um, the broad and depth of experience that I bring to this conversation. Um, for one, again, in my training, particularly as, as a social worker, licensed clinical social worker, and then um, having played in many different roles, particularly in supervisory administrative roles, and particularly my social identity as an African-American male and the mental health system, um, I think is really important for us to be able to share not only the experience that brings to it, but also at this particular time when the field of psychiatry and mental health um, is working to obviously undo a lot of institutional racism that exists. Um, I think it's important to understand what it is to be the, have the experience of a black clinician or a person of color and the mental health. Now, if I could be really transparent in some of the conversations and obviously as we go through the different slides that we're going to be um, discussing, um, I will try my best to be very transparent uh, my training obviously is at Smith, and so um, I do speak a lot from a psychodynamic um, perspective, but definitely uh, there are other um, theoretical frameworks, in particular around my social identity, that really does impact uh, the work that I do. Um, and having played uh, in various roles and supervisory roles, I think it's critical that we understand the experience of a black clinician, particularly in the mental health field. Recognizing that in psychiatry and particularly grand rounds, a lot of times our disciplines and this grand rounds, there's always a lot of focus uh, around psychiatry and, and doctors. But I want to challenge us uh, in our grand rounds and particularly in the future or so of continue to provide a very inclusive environment. Um, and when we talk about the clinical setting, right, it does not necessarily mean it's the field of psychiatry. Psychiatry includes social workers, psychologists, caseworkers, service uh, personnel, and the environment that we're trying to create in our diversity, equity, inclusion work. Um, the power differentials exist, and I think it's as critical a time as now for us to even have some of these conversations around the silos that we have participated in that has contributed to um, what we continue to name as racism and psychiatry. And that's something that we have to really um, acknowledge. There's definitely a lot of literature out there. Um, and I think that as we continue to have these grand rounds for us to also look at what role do we play in this. So what are our objectives today? We're gonna first examine some of the literature uh, of the black therapist and the white client dyad. Uh, we're going to, or I'm going to introduce the whole concept of broaching as it relates to this clinical dyad. And I'm going to be speaking from a, my own case experience. So I will be providing a case exemplar um, of work that I've done with actually a white adolescent male um, in a course of three years of treatment who has had prior to seeing me 
um, a history of, of hospitalizations. Um, but with that work came such a rich experience of not only me exploring my own cultural countertransference in the work, and particularly as these racial enactments, reenactments and projections occurred in that clinical space, but also looking again at how I was able to manage all that. And when I say manage all that, there lies the role that we play in regards to being able to have um, supervision, being able to acknowledge when this is um, embedded within the system, being able to have uh, space and a voice to be able to process my own unconscious feelings around this work. Um, and then again, how do we advance this and uh, address it in the larger context of, of mental health? And then last, again, be able to uh, recommend where do we go from here in all of this. So when we're looking at the literature, particularly of the experiences of Black therapists, um, and particularly we have to um, recognize that there is a lot of literature out there in regards to cultural um, competence and partic particularly work with the uh, racially and ethnically um, clients. Um, but there are not a lot, there's really little, if not any, um, literature in regards to clinicians of color's experiences when working with white patients or clients. And when I talk about the literature, um, I again want to make sure that I'm being inclusive because I do have a social work um, degree and background that I'm also speaking across the disciplines of both medical psychology and social work and some of the other social sciences or so. And so my presentation uh, is not necessarily through the field or discipline of um, psychiatry, but it is pretty much inclusive of, of all of these experiences as black therapists or whatever our discipline is. Um, there's definitely a host of uh, research studies around racial matches and the racial differences. Um, but again, there is still little known regarding what these dialogues that take place. Um, for those of us who really acknowledge, you know, and understand microaggressions and how they're committed as opposed to overt um, racial um, acts and everything else too, is that there is plenty of literature that does speak to the microaggressions that occur within some of these, these dyads. Um, I will um, just highlight, you know, the few um, studies that have been done, particularly around this particular experience of Black therapists with white clients. Um, you know, and we would talk about some of these stereotypes, these racial stereotypes, which, uh, you know, again, being transparent, um, these are also very painful um, stereotypes and experiences for people of color. Um, I will be speaking more from a Black African American uh, lens, but I just want to highlight as we're continuing to educate ourselves, not only in um, the racial oppression that has, has occurred within our own United States history, that these um, particular um, events um, that are now occurring continue to resonate within the work that we're doing. One particular study um, that was done particularly does highlight some of these racial stereotypes. Um, and this is from Kelly and Green in 2010. And when I speak about that within the Black community in particular, um, Black female therapist experiences talking about what it's like to work with them is very not only personal, but it is you know, wrought with a lot of emotion uh, that we bring to that space. Um, so Kelly and Green looked at their own African American identities, right, and, and recognized within that clinical space that their gender, skin complexion, sexual orientations, and hair textures were all experienced within that space, in that therapy space. Um, and just as the few studies that were there, 
you know, um, there are definitely um, the experiences that they've had to um, respond to and, and the assumptions that many of their clients experience or so was in that space. But one of the things that we continue to wrestle with is the fact that we don't know how to bring some of these um, issues up in, in, in the therapy, you know, whether it's with the clients and definitely within our uh, supervisory space. Another recent study um, highlights um, a mental health counseling program of six African-American female students and two predominantly white um, colleges. And, and that small sample size of two white female faculty and two white male faculty and explore the black students counseling preparation in regards to counseling white clients and also the role that the counseling programs contributed to the preparedness of these two universities. This is what um, we're here for. So what does all this mean? Um, all of this means pretty much is that uh, there is obviously a lack of preparation, a lack of training, uh, particularly around the experiences of black clinicians, particularly when we're in these um, mental health settings such as the IOL. And I think that we have to also be very honest um, and recognize first of all that there is a minority of persons. When I say minority, I'm speaking of the, the uh, number and not particularly the minority status of, of, of um, clinicians of color, first of all. Uh, and so with that, you know, I think we all can agree, those of us who are in this space or room is that's very isolating. And so many of the experiences in these few studies um, that are part of our um, literature really resonate for some of the experiences that we have and continue to have in that space. Um, the five themes in this particular study again, um, highlights a lot of the microaggressions that even the, the black students experience in the program, the stereotyping that happens, you know, within clients that they're serving. Um, and then uh, oftentimes our authenticity is challenged, which means, you know, in the field of, of mental health and, and therapy, you know, part of our role in, uh, in the therapeutic relationship is trying to be as authentic as possible. But unfortunately, when we experience many of these um, projections or microaggressions and everything else too. There's never been permission to talk about this um, within our, our academic um, or clinical settings. Um, the need for counter spaces becomes again, a very um, much need for folks of color um, in order to process some of these feelings and what happens is that they have to initiate and seek this out in their own personal spaces and time, which speaks again to where do we go from here? So that need for counter spaces really is what is the support? What is in place, you know, organizationally or so in order for um, persons of color who experience these particular racial mi microaggressions on a continual basis? And then lastly is the need for cultural sensitivity amongst faculty. This is not part of any curriculum um, that exists. And if, you were to, if we were to examine any of the trainings or curriculum, whether it's in medical schools or in any of the doctoral programs that many of us have heard, whether it's in our psychology programs or not, you know, that we probably want to, um, you know, go back into our memory banks to, to um, recall we, what kind of training or what was in the curriculum, which means that faculty is not providing also this um, level of, of training or support. So um, I am going to highlight um, the work that I did again with Paul, um, not knowing that I would be three, to, three years later, um, particularly um, presenting on it, but it, within this work, there was um, a lot of not only um, racial projections that I experienced um, in this work with him, but again, with the white male, how do I even broach the topic around race, you know, um, or ethnicity or culture, you know, when we're again, 
um, asked to, you know, identify what our treatment goals are, what are the symptoms or so, and then just as in this one study that I just spoke about, speak to, does race all, does race then become my default in talking about it or am I personalizing it? And that becomes again, the experience of black clinicians or so, um, you know, either being accused of um, throwing out the race card or is this again, uh, impacting the relationship that um, I am trying to have with this client. So we're going to enter into some of that space um, and broaching. So Dave Vines and colleagues um, came up with a conceptual model for how do we broach the whole conversation around race. You know, broaching um, is just an attitude of openness, right? But a commitment by the therapist to invite and explore any issues around diversity, right? That hopefully will enhance the therapeutic relationship um, that we have. Um, and again, as I mentioned within that one study, um, the authenticity, authenticity, right? Oftentimes becomes challenged um, if we do not broach the whole idea around race and diversity. Um, my slide is out of order, so I apologize um, because I wanted to highlight what some of the comments were in that particular um, study with those six students, right? And some of these um, comments was that they couldn't again discuss the issues, right? When it was in their clinical space. Um, and again, as I mentioned, just did not want to be seen as playing the race card or didn't know how to bring up the issues. And when I talk about not how to bring up these issues, we're talking about bringing up the issues within our own supervision or within, our, within the setting of our peers, right? And so what happens is that there is this silence. Um, we become silenced. And of course, it becomes very uncomfortable material. You know, as one student said, I'm the only minority. They are all white students that makes me not open up and talk about these difficulties with white clients. So I don't want them to think I don't know what I'm doing. All right, so as we um, talk about what my experience is with this white male, a lot of similarities, particularly around this, that I will highlight within my own experience of having supervision, um, particularly with two white supervisors. So again, as I talk about conceptually the broaching um, concept of Dave Vines, you know, as in many developmental models or so, is that they have the five broaching styles. Um, if we are to examine some of these broaching styles, you know, we can definitely identify where we are, particularly around this whole conversation around race within the own clinical space. Um, so avoidant is obviously remaining this race neutral as if we were colorblind society. And that, you know, oftentimes we default to, well, all lives matter, right? And so there lies, again, the whole avoiding broaching that doesn't matter. It's like everybody is treated the same, right? And then you have isolating and then infusing all the way down. You know, infusing where it's a commitment that we now have to social and racial justice and it's embedded within who you are. So maybe, you know, being able to identify where you fall within that particular identity model. Are you, are we, some of us now moving into continue to figure out, like, how do we start to explore that and it become part of our practice um, to the point that we can get to being totally immersed and addressing racial diversity issues within the clinical space? Or are we still checking off, I asked a question in the particular um, the first session that I had with the client. And, and I feel that that is now my task is done. Um, if any of us are familiar with any of the racial identity development models, Helms for one who's, who's been um, reference oftentimes in the literature is that this broaching model also fits within the racial identity status. You know, again, uh, there's the white identity models and there are also black identity models that are out there. And it, is, it again goes back to what is your attitude towards broaching? 
you know, um, are you still refuse to approach? Are you avoiding it? Or again, are we at a point that we recognize and acknowledge the, the importance of all diversity related, um, you know, characteristics that are formed into the relationship and the work that we do. So why is broaching important? Of course, um, it's very, it's important in regards to, um, there's a healing that happens, you know, whether it's the healing that's happening for the client who is part of a racialized, um, marginalized community, or even for the, for the clinician, and particularly in this um, context of this, uh, we're gonna be talking about it from a black clinician's um, perspective, right? And creates some level of emotional safety. And of course, you know, intimacy, um, for those of us who are not afraid of creating intimate, having a level of intimacy within our um, relationship with clients, um, there is also how we still acknowledge that painful history, but also the painful differences and realities that exist. You know, being able to recognize and acknowledge white privilege and how some have benefited, but the painful and the history and the legacy of slavery for, for African Americans in our country. Um, again, broaching, um, you know, totally dismisses us being colorblind um, and erases, you know, some of those biases that we um, have to acknowledge. Um, and if we don't consider race and representation, there lies again the frustra frustration that many of our clients experience. Um, Perez Foster um, identified clinicians' cultural countertransference. And this is something that we're going to be speaking a lot about for the duration of this presentation. Um, if I can recall last week's um, Grand Rounds, Dr. Um, Ayat, um, the question ended with the role that countertransference plays within this clinical relationship. As I mentioned earlier, having been trained psychodynamically, uh, having, I've had to accept the reality that there's a lot of countertransference that I have. Right, and again, part of that is, is having the permission and acknowledge it within the own clinical training that it exists, right? And oftentimes, you know, as I tell many of my students, um, is that it's okay to have the counter transference, right? As long as we recognize what it is. And there is obviously the positive and the negative counter transference that happens, right? And where does it come from? So Perez Foster, and from those cultural derived personal life values, that we have, that we bring into the work. Again, the second one, what academic training and theoretical frameworks that we have, right? I obviously have some level of bias to having a psychodynamic orientation. Um, and, and part of that also comes with a level of, of privilege that I will, I will acknowledge that I may have coming from Smith as opposed to some other type of program. Um, the emotional driven biases about ethnic groups is part of that cultural trans, um, transference. And then our own feelings around our own self identity, right? Um, that's also part of that counter transference. Um, so, what are the racial projections? Racial projections, Comas Diaz. Um, I recommend if no one's familiar with that as a psychologist, she's written quite a bit uh, around multicultural care, you know, and obviously around a lot of the um, cultural um, diversity themes that exist within the field of, of psychology and, and, and psychotherapy or so. But she frames this whole therapist of color, color white patient dyad as this demographic curiosity, right? And, and obviously, space that lends itself for all this fertile ground for these projections, right? That's full of conscious and unconscious messages about both the client and the clinician's cultural backgrounds, right? And obviously this involves not only the clinician and white clients, um, 
experiences amongst their own races, but again, within the larger context of what's happening within the interactions um, within our larger society, right? So it's again, this unfolding of these um, events, emotions and everything else too, and particularly around uh, this unresolved matters around the marginalities that we've all experienced. Um, and again, the objectifications and projections are at the core of what anti-racism work is about. So this brings me to um, the work in the case that I'm going to present. Um, and then in my own theoretical application, which speaks again to my own personal self and to the work that I do, the theoretical applications that I oftentimes apply to my work um, is through several of these um, frameworks, um, you know, being psychodynamically trained, but I also bring critical race, obviously being African American male, I, I, I see the world, I experience the world, you know, through the power um, differences, right, that exist. And so um, it would be negligent of me not to um, account for th that role that it plays in my life, even as a clinician. You know, as much as I can hold a lot of uh, power and privilege in my position as a therapist, I also have to experience the world as an African American male. So critical race is really part of um, a framework that I oftentimes infuse within the work that I do. Um, as you heard earlier again in, my, in the bio, um, I have a, a 25 years of background experience you know, in trauma work, having worked obviously within um, the Department of Children and Families. And again, we're talking about obviously the level of significant trauma that many of children and, and the child welfare system experience. That has been my, been my foundational training. In addition, systems theory becomes again what social work is, is about. And so when we're talking about the richness of what is brought to the mental health system, social workers in particular work within the systems framework. You know, in medicine, we oftentimes are addressing the symptoms, but unfortunately the symptoms are also impacted by what's happening in the largest society. So through ecological frameworks or so, uh, again, it would be negligent for me not to consider that or, can, or any of us as who are practicing social workers. Um, and I also don't <laughs> want to minimize and acknowledge that even in, in, in field of medicine and psychiatry, that many of you also work from this framework. So I don't want to be um, misinterpreted, but in particularly social work field, there lies the wealth um, and obviously the broad theoretical frameworks that we do bring to this. Um, I'm a big fan of Donna Winnicott, who was a uh, medical doctor and worked with children uh, and families. And so I, I wanted to at least acknowledge um, his level of influence and particularly a lot of the work that he did, particularly with children and families, but also in how he described culture um, and the cultural experience and all this transitional phenomena in this space that we share in our humanity. Obviously this is in 1971, so we're talking obviously 50 years later on how this definition has, has somewhat changed over time, but just wanting to recognize the historic reference to how culture has at one time been defined. So, who is Paul? I want to um, think it's important to uh, talk a little bit about Paul. Um, as he came to me, and then how did these racial projections start? So um, I put a description of Paul up there um, on purpose, and this is how I wrote it in the article um, that was published in 2017, how he appeared to me, and how he appeared most of the time. You know, this white male, 17-year-old from Upper New England, he had this preppy look, often had a, a slight resemblance to Tom Cruise. And I was introduced to him when I was serving in the capacity of Deputy Director at Casey uh, 
on family services. And in the role that I was playing at that particular time, I uh, was asked um, in that administrative role to help secure a foster care placement from one state to another. Um, and that was how he and I were introduced. At that particular time, Paul was actually attending this private school, unbeknown to us that he was living in Connecticut for those, for those three months before I actually received a phone call. Um, and during that time, he was um, in the child welfare, you know, uh, there is this whole idea around permanency planning and permanency planning in the sense that he was being reunified with his father. Um, who he had not lived with since his early childhood. And so when he was living in this Western Connecticut town, I received a call from, at that point, my colleague who was in another state asking me if I can have my staff try to find a foster home for him. Because at that particular time, he was at this private school and, and I'll speak a little bit more about the, the private school because that was when I started to experience the very first racial projection. Um, that the actual tuition there was 50 something thousand dollars or so. But it's interesting because this private school actually um, was for students who've had some type of either learning disability or special education or so. So, and, and it was a residential school as well. Um, and I was not particularly aware of it, but what was very interesting was that this actual um, school setting was in the town that I grew up next to. Um, and so I find that you know, it was you know, pretty unique to the experiences called that I will talk about a little bit later. So again, Paul um, had early childhood uh, abandonment issues, particularly was removed from his mother's care um, within his first um, to two years. Um, he, has, he had four siblings, I mean, three siblings. He was one of four. He had an older brother who was a, a little over a year older than him, who actually was biracial. Um, Paul, who's white, but he had an older brother who was um, African American and white. And then he had two sisters um, who were uh, one and two years younger than him. All four of them grew up separate from each other. And he had had some. Um, communication with them, but it had always been inconsistent over the years. The two sisters actually had uh, were, lived and grew up with their patern with their fathers, but his brother was also in the foster care system. Paul then um, was in foster care in, in another state and then had been adopted at age nine. Um, and then from there, um, he was in an adoptive home. Um, and unfortunately, he experienced a lot of physical, um, psychological abuse at the hands of his adoptive father um, and a lot of domestic violence that occurred um, to the point that his adoptive mother had actually um, left him, um, you know, to left him because of her own physical abuse from the father. And Paul then entered back into the foster care system. And then from there, you know, when efforts failed to find a permanent home for him, um, through the work that he did with his own therapist, um, sought out his um, birth father. And that's when I became involved in the therapeutic work with him. So with that, you know, some of his, his mental status um, um, is indicated in the description of Paul. Um, various diagnoses, but again, it's um, definitely his trauma history. Um, you know, there were some episodes I'll talk a little bit about during the, the different phases of um, my treatment with him, of uh, some of his big, uh, depressive um, moods or so, and definitely some uh, access to traits that I experienced. Um, it's also very important for me to highlight my role, you know, and who I am, you know, particularly the bio doesn't speak to a whole lot outside of what um, accomplishments, professional and academics or so, but I think it's very important when we're talking about these racial projections and what it stirs up and that, that, that counter transference. So a little bit about myself. I was born in the deep South, actually in Mississippi, 
and spent my very first year of life there, um, having then come back to Connecticut with my mom. And, um, and, um, and then I had a brother at the time that we then were living in Connecticut. I lived in Connecticut and Litchfield County for the duration of my school, um, third grade all the way until um, college. Um, and in that particular town, we were one of few black families into that day. There's not that much diversity there. So I was the only black student, one of two, and a class of 250, one of two minority students, um, the other being a, a, a Chinese American uh, student, um, and had a pretty, pretty successful academic experience, with the exception of hearing a lot of the racial epithets and everything, you know, in the hallways or so, but pretty much, you know, my own experience with, with racism obviously was um, camouflaged by obviously this double consciousness that I continue to carry into my own professional identity. So again, what does that mean? I definitely understood whiteness. I understood what white privilege meant. Um, and of course, did uh, my best to assimilate to many of the white norms. So that has been obviously a lot of my childhood experience. Um, and then, then as I've gone on to college and graduate, Again, I've uh, been in, in many, all of my academics were predominantly white institutions. Um, and so I say that for the reason as I start to talk about how this therapeutic relationship also began, is that I also, you know, pride myself of the fact that um, a lot of negative stereotypical images that many people have of Black and African Americans or so is that I do come from a background of college educated, you know, and now in their fourth college educated uh, families having aunts and, and, and my parents did not graduate, but we did um, value education to the point that my grandmother, you know, um, was also um, in college or so. And then as Kamisha um, has highlighted, which was important in my bio, is that we also come from a um, tradition of being in black um, Greek letter fraternities and sororities that I find myself to be very proud of being in. So that social identity comes into play here because when we start to talk about um, the intersectionalities of this, class is definitely also in that clinical space between Paul and I um, because he describes his family as low achievers, as low lives, and when we talk about how our treatment started and why he was at the school that he went to, he bragged about the fact that he um, conned the state that he came from into paying for um, $50,000 for him to go to school with no intentions of being reunified with his father. Um, that to me was the first racial um, projection that I experienced, particularly in, in regards to his devaluation of who I was, uh, because from that experience, obviously came my own emotional reaction to how he was comfortable enough to brag in, with in the beginning phases of our relationship. Uh, and then I'm also in a position, supposedly a power, um, as a professional, um, the amount of money with no intentions and in, of being reunified. So there was definitely the devaluation that I'd already experienced um, that I needed to figure out how, what do I do with that? So as we move into this counter transference um, experiences that became one of those very first experiences that I had um, with him. I just want to highlight some of the other um, meanings of counter-transference, you know, um, Ben and, and colleagues also propose this a factor model of counter-transference that therapists um, experience. Um, and in the description that I will present in my case, I want to um, compare some of these. So some of that is obviously feeling of overwhelmness and, and disorganized, you know, but of course I mentioned earlier, some of the po positive counter-transference that I experienced, right? Um, sexualized, 
um, kind of transference and definitely the parental protective, which in the a role of a person being represented in a foster care system, that was definitely a lot of my kind of transference that I had for Paul, which I would also um, balance off with as much as there are many racial projections um, and assumptions and the biases that we experience, there is definitely a lot of positive kind of transference that I will also um, highlight in regards to my role of wanting to protect him, wanting to parent him as a father, given his trauma and histories around abandonment. Okay, so some of those feelings that I had particularly range obviously from the rage, uh, rage and anger to again, the shame and incompetence. I said earlier that I was a big fan of Winnicott. And so of course, um, trying to provide as good enough um, holding environment for him as possible. But also the article that I really speak about is again, this question of was I good enough for, for Paul when, it, when his entire system, whether it was a system of foster care or the state that he came from and his family members that could never um, live up to any of his expectations, that there was always this question around my role and particularly as a black male, um, was I ever good enough for him to live up to his standards? Uh, because um, a lot of times in that space, he had these, this expectation because he understood what white privilege was. You know, and white privilege to him means that I'm going to get whatever I can from the state and you're going to pay me. So he definitely had this expectation. Um, and because I was in, at the particular time that I was in a role in administration, that there was this devaluation that I was also experiencing. Um, unbeknown to me, after our very first meeting, um, when he did not allow me to come beyond the parking lot that I actually met him um, at the school, those 35 minutes that we initially met, um, that obviously there lies again the whole um, experience and question that I had around race. How is this uh, young man going to experience me as this black male? Um, and particularly in this entirely white environment, and he comes from upper New England. So there's definitely a lot of the counter-transference feelings of, of this devaluation. I have my own insecurity and the rejection. And of course, as I mentioned earlier before, a lot of the code switching that oftentimes clinicians of color have to do. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about, how much time do we have? Just wanna, 1240, okay. We have uh, five minutes. So a lot of the, the racial projections that I experienced within this um, had a lot to do again with um, the fact that he then um, oftentimes criticized his brother um, who had a totally different life trajectory than him, being biracial, um, who also um, grew up in the state, in another state of Vermont or Maine, if I can recall, who experienced definitely a lot more um, discrimination. And obviously, he was left up to his own um, as he aged out of the system and unfortunately became involved in the law. And he was very critical of him. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of counter-transference that I continue to experience um, still spoke to um, him being very, very critical that his brother was not doing well. However, he totally, um, he always minimized the level of support that he was getting. And so as, as I struggled with that as, as, his, as his clinician as to how to broach any of these kind of conversations or so. Um, so when we go into how do I broach these conversations, whatever, it's very important for me to highlight um, my supervision that I have not um, talked about. And the supervision that I had um, was with two white clinicians, one a psychologist, um, Dr. Harry Parada out of Boston, who was my clinical supervisor um, for, for this entire time that I was treating him, who was a white Jewish man, um, had 40 plus years of experience. Um, and the other clinical supervisor that I had uh, was a PhD licensed clinical social worker of 30 years. And they provided the framework to be able 
to process a lot of the cultural counter-transference that I was experiencing, particularly with the work that I had with him. Um, there's a few other racial projections I want to highlight. So in the course of the, the three months that he was at this school, he was um, suspended. He was actually expelled. He was expelled for a larceny event that he was involved in. And when, when I initially broached the conversation about his comfort level with um, working with an African-American male, um, he um, <laughs> it somehow said, oh, well, absolutely. I said, you know, because there lies some of the racial stereotypes that went into um, the conversation. And basically what he, he said was that, oh yeah, because, um, you know, I'm really good friends with the black kids that are here. And of course he identified them as being the unscholarship um, in particular. And the school actually did have um, an international presence, um, which were quite a few privileged and students that came from affluent communities. And so even though he struggled with his foster care status, he tried very hard to fit in. And so that was one of the ways that he was able to accept me into this role. But however, I knew that there was a lot more internally happening with him. So that was one of the areas of, of how race became part of our um, conversations. Um, but then what ended up happening at that point was that he got expelled. And at that particular time he got expelled, his whole world, you know, came falling down in regards to, you know, this whole experience of him, you know, um, and going through this whole feelings of depersonalization to the point that he was almost hospitalized. Um, it was almost if I was experiencing this death when this kid, when they obviously um, told him he could never return back. Um, and then this role, this is where our therapeutic relationship strengthened even more. And there lies my own counter-transference um, kicked in obviously of wanting to protect him and also this role of, of, of rescuing him in the sense that um, he had already had his um, abandonment issues. So that particular experience then led to a series of different placements for him throughout where I needed to create this whole new environment for him as he experienced um, placement after placement within two year period. Um, to the point that he was also placed within a single, another African-American um, foster homo male who worked a lot um, and he basically had a room that he just provided for him, but not a lot of emotional um, support. And again, I became um, that support for him processing his feelings. But one thing, thing that stood out was the fact that he actually was, had to attend school in Hartford. You know, and as a white male who comes from an entirely white community, particularly this kid now having to go to school at Hartford High. <laughs> and as I'm speaking to those of, of you who are in the Hartford community, you know that demographically, um, Hartford High does not have a lot of white students. He actually graduated there. Um, and again, in my description of some of these racial projections that occurred, he prided himself on the fact that he got black and Puerto Rican students to talk with one another. So there was a sense of bravado that he had um, that he would oftentimes bring to our space, which I always questioned the truth of it or not. Um, I questioned um, the truth of when he said he was dating um, black girls or so, um, but never brought that into our conversation. So these are things that I've always had to process in my own supervision with permission of course. But one of the other things that really stood out for me, um, which was also a very difficult to withhold because it again spoke to, again, these racial stereotypes that existed, was that he oftentimes talked about how he took AP courses um, and um, the work that I did with him when he had to request something in writing, recognize the gaps that he had in his own writing. So I question, obviously, um, his AP status, which I knew was not true, but basically he had to be smarter than the other Black and Puerto Rican students. Um, and if I could be as transparent as possible, his writing skills were that of a, two, a second, third grader, as opposed to a student who was then in his senior year in high school. Um, 
So it spoke to a lot of discomfort that I had and all these racial dynamics that were in the space and everything that I oftentimes experienced his not only arrogance, um, but again, there's this, this great light of hope that I, I'm rescuing the Black and Puerto Ricans because I recognize obviously the racial conflict that come in, come, that um, exists within these communities. And now I'm here now and I fix that. So this was always in our clinical space as well. Um, there's many other racial projections that I could um, experience, but one of, the, one of the things that I wanna highlight um, is that when I was, was struggling with, I had several losses during a phase of our treatment um, of losing not only my dad, but also going through a divorce at times of, of my, his need for me to be emotionally present and I never received anything in return. And these were very feelings that I've had to process within my own level of supervision. Um, but a moment after the death of my father, three months later, when I was visiting my mom, who was at that point living in the South, um, you know, I made all the provisions for his um, therapy and support and that when I was gonna be gone for a week or two. And, and when I returned apologizing for my emotional absence, um, we were able to hold such a um, uh, intimate moment that he said he recognized that I was gone. He called Steve, you were there. You were, you lost your father, and it was the very first time, and at that point, a two-year therapeutic relationship that he got a that he actually acknowledged me when at during those other two years that I always felt like I was overextending myself and it speaks to again that whole level of incompetence or I'm not good enough that I felt like I went over and beyond because of that racial dyad that I had that I had to be good for this white um, client or so. So um, I'll leave it at that. I want to definitely open it up for any questions that people may have. I know that we're in stretch for time um, and just want to leave it open for folks. To ask any questions and, I, and I'm gonna jump jump in Steve can you hear me yes so uh, fantastic that was wonderful and uh, a lot a lot of things to, to kind of say and ask myself I know there's a number of questions that have come up and I'm gonna to try to help facilitate a, a dialogue I want to just uh, first um, uh, acknowledge that we, uh, if, when people, uh, when I said in the beginning, uh, bear with us while we may have some glitches, um, uh, you were uh, blissfully, uh, did not know probably, um, Steve, that we, the, the good news and bad news, we, people were, were uh, uh, really lined up to come in, but we were locked in at 100 participants participants and oh, wow. so <laughs> we're gonna have to troubleshoot that <laughs> and so I apologize I know that actually there are people on the call who got knocked off initially and then were able to get in because they kept trying to get in and other people bumped off so uh, I'm sorry to you and of course the people that I really want to apologize to aren't in the meeting so we'll, we'll figure that out but um, so um, let's see how we're gonna do this I think I'm going to try to I'm gonna I've got I've got people lined up I'm going to start with uh, Ayat, and what I'm going to do is try to find her and unmute her. And Ayat, I have unmuted you. Let's see if that works. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Hi, Ayat. Hi, Dr. Hoffer. How are you? This was great. I, I was one of the people that was kept tagging in to try to get in, so I came in a little bit late, so I might have missed... Um, some of this, but I did want to just um, first say thank you for this. It's really great to kind of um, and echo kind of what Dr. Shagan mentioned in the comments, which is, you know, for you to kind of be vulnerable and share your own experiences and the challenges that you kind of experience going through this work. Um, I wanted to, at the end, you kind of made the clinical recommendation about um, improving curricula, and I'm, I'm all about figuring out new ways to kind of do that. Um, I recently read something that highlighted how um, sometimes in our effort to be more inclusive of literature, what we're really, we're still um, in, in, in doing that, we're also creating stereotypes. So like the idea of relying on like Toni Morrison or ta Coates who have these really powerful novels about the black experience, if we're constantly using that to educate ourselves, 
in monitoring our own transference or countertransference, we might be continuing to further kind of stereotype the black experience. And so I'm curious if you have any thoughts about ways we can kind of monitor that, especially if you mentioned, you know, working with maybe supervisors who are white and being a person of color, but not a black person, how I can still catch myself in that and be, be mindful of what does this countertransference mean? Is it really about their racial identity or is this something that I'm now pathologizing. So if you have any thoughts about any of that, I would. Yeah, no, I, I, I think again, I at what you're doing, I think we need to continue to um, have the dialogues, right? You know, one of the things that I, I can, I, you know, was, was struggling with as I was um, highlighting the literature at the very beginning was that we do not have a lot of literature from the clinical field, particularly around some of these narratives, right? And so this is particularly the narrative around the clinician of color with white clients, because we have a lot of that. So I think it's important for us to continue to not only um, provide the level of training, but we need to still also provide, you know, what's the evidence that's out there and the experiences, right? Which there's not. So I, I, I think it would be, um, again, negligent if we're not entering into the space, but also, you know, what helped me get through this work was the supervision that I was getting but not only the supervision from black people, because again, if you look at any of the studies that are out there, a lot of times, you know, we're black, black or um, persons of color of supervisors or so, is that we don't necessarily have space or permission to talk about these things, right? And I think that's one of the things that we're having at IOL right now is that we have to at first get comfortable even just talking about race, right? And now what's the impact that's having in the clinical um, relationship, whether it's for clinician or as well as for our clients, but we don't have a lot of material, particularly from this perspective or so. So um, I hear when you say you struggle with it, so there lies again our own ins insecurity, which really becomes now how we have pathologized and how we have internalized that pathology, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's the place that we now need to, to move for because there lies again my own insecurities around it, right? Is that it's not important, you know, and it speaks to these students again, nobody wants to hear about it. Well, obviously we don't even write about it because we don't have permission. And it speaks to the power differential that exists also in the field, you know, which is why it's important for me to talk about it from a social worker perspective, because really who holds the power is medicine and science and psychiatry. So there is still this whole legacy, you know, mm -hmm. that's painful that again speaks to why you as an identified or a person of, of color feel like this is not value. Absolutely, thank you for that. Yeah, I think that's something that um, even in like the publications that get accepted, what are we like, who holds the power? Like who are the people sitting on these editorial boards who are accepting yeah. the-, yeah. the and, and that's obviously a, 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 a conversation that if you speak to those oh. from the black psychological societies or black whatever, you're going to definitely get a totally different perspective. It's not accepted in this peer review journal and everything else too. So we have to talk about these things amongst ourselves as opposed to a white audience like IOL. Excellent, and we have a number of questions, uh, Steve, so I'm gonna to try to get to them. Uh, the next one, I'm gonna to try to unmute uh, Dr. Brianna Pollock here, who has an excellent question. There we go. Brianna, are you there? I am, as long as you can hear me. I can hear you, great. Wonderful, uh, thank you so much, this was amazing. I have many questions and thoughts. I also um, wasn't able to get in until uh, almost halfway through, and so I apologize if this is something that you spent time on, but um, for me as a psychodynamic and psychoanalytically oriented clinician, I really appreciate the integration of the clinical work with all of the other work that um, you presented here today, I think that's something that we can get lost um, when we talk about issues of race and sex and lots of other different intersectional identities um, within the context of clinical work. And one of the things that I've been spending time on, and I think psychoanalysis as a field has been trying to um, grapple with, is how to work through its roots in racism and sexism and lots of other isms that are problematic and still hold on to the ideas that are applicable and meaningful. And I'm curious how you, or if you have reconciled that and help another struggling clinician try to do that as well. 
Yeah, um, Dr. Pollock, um, I, I appreciate that. And I know you're, you're, you're playing a, a major role, right, in advancing some of the work. Again, what do I do um, as I rely on white people at this particular point, right? Because a lot of times, you know, even in what I presented, right, most people of color, black people, we can relate to all of this, all these experiences, right? And it becomes pretty common, right? Because a lot of, you know, we're obviously trained that we are trained to serve, you know, the majority population. But again, you know, in, in the same, um, you know, literature, right? You know, there's a whole lot around race, racial matching or so. Um, but again, it speaks to, again, how this has been institutionalized to the point that it's become emotionally exhausted. So in any of the racial justice or social justice work that's happening in any particular system is that how do we do this? We now need white folks because we are tired and exhausted from trying to move what power we don't hold, right? In psychiatry or so. So it does speak to leadership if that is one way um, to, to offer it. You know, I think, you know, and part of the um, uh, earlier presentation when I had too is recognizing also where do you fit within the identity model, right? Or particularly around the whole broaching idea or stuff. And I think that's where everybody can just easily, you know, place themselves and where are you with that, right? You know, whether we're honest about it or not, right? My role and obviously in my consulting role as well as the fact that I feel that it's important for me to not only continue to practice, which is what I do, but also to try to move the system, right? And moving the system means holding leadership and the others, you know, accountable for the role that they play in perpetuating um, racism, you know? And then, but, and I think part of it is also, you know, my bio, after having 25 years, I make no apologies for using the word or saying it now, right? Because I have to experience it, right? So it does speak, uh, it's so multi-layered, you know, it's so multi-layered, but I think this is a starting point, right? That we can even have space, right? In the grand rounds, but it's also the other work that everyone is doing. Does Thank that you. help? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm, um, I'm trying my multitasking facilitating skills here. Uh, you guys uh, are free to look in the chat uh, uh, discussion, by the way. There's some uh, great things going uh, on in there, giving you compliments, Steve, on a variety of things, including, um, you know, your, your openness and your style. Um, uh, Kamisha uh, Morris uh, has a question. I think uh, you can, people can unmute themselves now. And you, you can, I think, because you're a uh, host as well. So Kamisha, we'll go to you and then uh, go on from there. Steve, I guess this is like a comment question kind of thing. Um, I was just very struck by uh, when you talked about that feeling of incompetency and, um, you know, in that space. And I, I can so relate. And I'm just wondering, like, you know, you talk about dealing with that, and of course, you know, some of that feeling, you know, that insecurity and so forth, I think it's, it's my own stuff most, most definitely. But um, you talked about, you know, processing that in your supervision and so forth. But I'm wondering how, how did you deal with it otherwise, you know, whether personally or, you know, just curious about how did you navigate that? Because yeah. I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, okay, here's this kid, not very educated, right? Um, He's gone through so much trauma, um, just so much going on with him and you're a black man educated, you know, um, definitely if you're looking at class and status sits in a, a higher position than he is, but still yet him being a white um, male made you feel almost less than, feeling like you had to approve your um prove that you were good enough and so i'm just wondering how did you navigate that um even on a personal level yeah yeah no i, th I think it again it speaks to what many students right and any mental health or counseling or doctoral programs have to experience a lot of times that we have to find um again those counter spaces that was in one of the studies right um is that those counter spaces are are those shared identities that we have right with one another so i can if i can recall during my 
training, you know, my uh, residence training when I was at Smith or so, is that these experiences, right, are again, those experiences that we have to be able to process within not only a group setting, but within some of those um, professional networks, right? And you and I talk about this all the time, the importance of the Black social workers, right? National Association of Black Social Workers, right? Because a lot of times they don't address some of these salient issues when it pertains to race that again, we recognize as still systemic racism that exists. That's how I get through, right? Is being able to, you know, refuel myself, whether it's at a national conference where we can talk about some of these topics or so, but then on a personal level, I think it goes right back to the same thing, is that providing space for it and, and these students in that study, right? They have to figure, they have to find it themselves. They have to initiate it themselves, right? And so there lies again, how isolating it is for clinicians of color, particularly in the field of psychiatry, right? Because there's little resources um, that are out there besides, like you said, the, the impact that a lot of historical trauma has on our own personal psyche, which is always in that space. So um, to answer your question, you know, I, like you said, I think it goes back to the mentorship, mentorship and just our own shared experiences and providing that space, whether it's at IOL or not, right? And I think that's what we always find in the literature anyway, right, for individuals from marginalized groups, right, regardless of our educational status. That is still the reality. I think John, um, you, like, I think you have some, you know, grand round speakers who, you know, in your own, your, your peers and colleagues, right? They speak about these same experiences, right? Uh, of, of the racism that they exi that exists within the workplace. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna try to do, Steve, because we just have a few minutes, is I'm gonna give you a few questions that are out there and let you kind of, um, uh, pick one, okay, uh, or two. Um, one question uh, is, um, do you, how do you think your supervision may have been different if your supervisor was a person of color? So that, that's one. Mm -hmm. uh, another to summarize is, do you have a comment on, you know, if you haven't uh, already, um, on how, uh, on, how we think about a case like this in the context of we as a system still have a lot of work to do on uncovering our own implicit bias. So you're really tuned into it in the individual treatment, but you're existing in a, in a and you may have touched on that a bit. And then the third one is um, uh, interest in hearing more about your thoughts about Winnicott and, and culture and how that plays into it. So. Uh, you probably have time for just one of those. So. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I figured I'd give you a, a, a la carte. And, yeah, and absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'll start with the very first one. I think around um, the clinician, uh, I mean, the supervisor of color versus a white supervisor of color. Um, I'll say this, is that I, um, at times, pride myself for some of the peers, colleagues, and friends that I have in the clinical field who are white that have such a level of, of competence that are capable of providing such rich supervision. And so in the experience that I had with the two white um, psychologists, uh, Dr. Parad, who I will say has such a reputation from Boston, who's able to connect with black families and kids um, who's done such a brilliant job, right? And so that's kind of how I feel about that. Um, in regards to as long as they have the cultural sensitivity and the competence um, can do such excellent work, right? Because again, there lies not only the level of power, but again, it continues to inform his practice around cross-cultural dyad. So I think it's critical to have supervision from a person who might not be from the same race for those reasons, right? And there lies the experience I then have with my white female is that she's able to hear um, in her role of supervising me, obviously more or less supervising me, um, you know, obviously through theoretical stuff, that this is experience of me as a black male and allowing me the emotional safety to have these conversations, right? And so I think that's just as important, which goes to the Winnicott holding environment that, that 
Aloha Winnika, I really feel is applicable in many different cultures and communities because the sameness of being able to provide that holding environment in itself um, is just as important. Um, of course, we're, we're talking about how <laughs> uh, definition of culture is, looks very different than not explicitly talking about some of the racial history that we have now, which again, was never in any of the literature um, or the language of Donald Winnicott, but now that's infused with a lot more of the contemporary issues that we're experiencing now. If that's if that could respond to all three of those. Excellent. I mean, that's great. We're gonna we're gonna have to finish. We're at the end, uh, but wonderful presentation. I didn't even get to ask.